Welcome to our Good Friday service. If you'll go ahead and come and take your seat. Uh, just a few announcements as we get going today. Uh, first of all, this is very important. Uh, if you need to find a restroom, they are right across the street. You'll see a sign right by the restrooms if you need to use those tonight. Uh, also, there is a parking validator over here. So if you parked and got a ticket, if you park back here, you can get that and get that validated uh, before you head out tonight. Uh, also, you'll need a service bulletin this evening, and you can either find that on our website, stacathens.org, uh, or there's some paper copies back on that little pedestal. Um, and I'll just say it's great to gather um, as two congregations here in Athens, um, great to gather as those united uh, by Christ and by the Spirit. Our Good Friday liturgy begins together. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us pray. Almighty God, we beseech you to graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson tonight is from Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in the 13th verse. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Here ends the reading. Bye. 
Our second lesson is from the letter to the Hebrews, beginning in the 10th chapter, the first verse. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, for all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here ends the reading. <laughs>
Our gospel lesson today is from the gospel according to John, beginning in the 19th chapter, the first verse. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered them, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. Also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. 
But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Here ends the reading. And there you have it, the story of the most important event that's ever happened in the history of this planet, read to you, by the way, very, very nice job. You're good at this. <laughs> in, the years in, in my years in ministry, I've grown more and more uh, a passion for preaching about the cross. Um, Paul said that when he was among the Corinthians, he aimed, it was his aim to, uh, to know the cross, to, to know only Jesus and him crucified. Um, so typically uh, every year I try to dedicate Palm Sunday, which we just had last Sunday, Palm Sunday was the Sunday that I would preach about the cross because I always knew on Sunday I would have more people than I would on my Good Friday service. So it was really a Good Friday message that I always completely dedicated to the cross, although I want to preach the cross more and more because I don't know that we get it enough. We can never get it enough. We can never understand it uh, completely. But what a story, what a beautiful story of the cross. So. Paul also said when he was writing to the Corinthian church, he said that um, that the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's foolish. But to those who are being saved, it, it is the power of God. So think about that. The cross, the message of the cross. So you can say the preaching of the cross and some versions say the the word of the cross is power, the power of God. For those of us who are being saved. Really interesting. How's the power, how's the cross, the power of God for you and me personally? That's the question I want to explore in the few minutes that I have with you today. Uh, Fl Fleming Rutledge, a, uh, I'm going to quote an Episcopalian in this crowd. So, <laughs> Fleming Rutledge in her outstanding book, The Crucifixion, she says this. So bear with me. The Corinthian church is an important test case for Paul because that congregation seemed unable to locate itself correctly with regard to the crucifixion. And I want us to locate ourselves correctly with, with, in regard to the cross. She writes, they place themselves either beyond the cross as though already raised from the dead or above the cross as though suffering was behind them and beneath them rather than in the cross. These problems in Paul's judgment were the cause of the Corinthian Christians deficiencies with regard to love. That's why he wrote the famous 13th chapter of first Corinthians, where he wrote love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Sentimental and overly spiritualized love is not capable of the sustained, unconditional agape of Christ that was shown on the cross. Only from the perspective of the crucifixion can the true nature of Christian love be seen over against all the world calls love. So Paul thought that the Corinthians needed to, to see themselves correctly in regards to the cross. And somehow that was going to help them experience the power of God through the cross. So I don't want us to make the same mistake that the Corinthians made of either placing ourselves beyond the cross as though we don't any longer need its power or above it as though since Jesus died for us, we no longer share with him in life sufferings. I'm not going to suffer. I don't need to suffer. God doesn't want me to suffer. Jesus suffered for me. No, that's not the story of the cross. And I'm going to add two more mistakes. Nor should we be ignorant of the cross 
right? We don't want to be ignorant of what happened at the cross. And maybe just as dangerous if we think that if we know about it, then, then we're fine. How can we experience the power of the cross? How can we experience the power of God through the cross? How can we find ourselves in the cross? So I'm going to quickly make four suggestions. The first one is that I want you to own your part of the cross. Own your part, your role, if you will. You nailed him there. I nailed him there. Um, I was interviewing a spiritual director this last couple of weeks. And as we told our, our biographies of our lives and stories, she told me that, that she, uh, when she was a young girl and teenager, I think uh, she had a friend that found out that uh, she wasn't a Christian. And so her friend, she said, I became my friend's like uh, project. And so her friend was taking her to camp every summer and took her to church and meetings all the time. And so, th- so through this process, uh, uh, my spiritual director learned the gospel. She she learned what the cross was and, and she learned all the ins and outs of it. And she, she understood that Jesus died for people's sins, but she thought that he died for bad people's sin, not her. She wasn't bad. She wasn't a rapist. She wasn't a murderer. She wasn't a thief. You know, Jesus died for those people, but she didn't think she needed Jesus in that way. And then she had this crazy spiritual experience one evening she said she she God just showed her a vision of Jesus on the cross and she herself had the nail and was nailing the nails into his hands and feet and she said it was so profound and so moving that that's the time when she she gave her life to the Lord she said that's when I knew that that I too was guilty that I too needed a savior. At the end of this service, we're going to sing a song called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And I want you to pay attention to the second verse. It says this, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So that's my first point. I want you to uh, to own your role, own your part to see it. And I guess my, my practical suggestion would be that you maybe would be willing within the next few days to sit alone uh, and ponder your life. Do what Take a spiritual inventory. Take a personal inventory of your life and think about your shortcomings, your faults, your sins, and realize the reality of your part in putting Jesus on the cross. So so I want us, in, in my quest to help us experience the cross, the second point that I would make um, is to experience the freedom of forgiveness. I think we all understand that, that the cross bought us forgiveness we know that that this blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, but knowing it, knowing it's one thing, but experiencing it might be another. Uh, I think maybe the best way I know to experience what it feels like to be forgiven is confession. Is confession. I just yesterday had a friend just say, you know, we confess to God to be forgiven. We confess to one another to be healed. And that's what the scriptures teach, just that. That it's through our confession to God that we find and we experience the forgiveness of God. I want you to experience his forgiveness. I want you to know more than just, oh, I know my sins are forgiven, but to really experience forgiveness of sins, we need to actively be confessors of our sins. Um, and so that's the second thing to be confessors. So the third thing I would suggest in order to experience the power of the cross for the cross to be real and life giving and powerful in our lives is to realize or to maybe I should say allow the cross to be what destroys the world for you. Paul called it being crucified 
to the world. I want to read to you a couple places, both of them in Galatians. He said, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So through the cross, he, the world was crucified to him and he was crucified to the world. Earlier in, in that same book, he said this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I don't know, have you ever thought about it? you've been crucified? It's easy to think, well, Jesus was crucified. Look, I don't want to confuse this. The, the work of Christ on the cross was a, a work that only God could do. Um, but somehow, as we, as we uh, connect ourselves to him, as we align ourselves with Jesus through, uh, through faith, God somehow mysteriously causes us to be crucified, somehow joined with him. And so Paul said, look, uh, I, I consider myself to be dead to the world because of my being joined with Christ in that moment, in that dying to the world. Uh, when I was in college, there was a song that came out uh, that has meant a lot to me through the years. I've never forgotten the words. It's called Water Grave. I want to read to you one part of it and just be thankful that I don't want to sing to you. He said, in my house, there's been a mercy killing. The man I used to be has been crucified. And the death of this man was the final way of revealing that in a spiritual way to live, I had to die. Now, if I let that dead man linger in me, I might get a little idle in my way. So I'm going down to the Celebration River. I'm going to take this dead man down to a water grave. So how do we experience the power of God through the cross, through the message of the cross? I think that we need to ponder our baptism and think about the day that we became one with God. And... Look, if we take seriously the message of the cross, if we take seriously what he was dying for and what that meant and how that, that, that just crushed the powers, and when we align ourselves with him, that changes everything. That changes how we treat people. That, that changes the way we think about the poor. That changes the, what we think about people from, from different classes that we're in or, or different, different races. It changes everything. Because our whole lives now sh should be wrapped up in the fact that we were crucified with him. We're aligned with him. Our life is, is not our own anymore. We're completely changed. So I challenge you to meditate on the cross, to stick a, put a sticky note on your mirror. That's the old fashioned way. Or put a reminder on your phone. Every morning pops up. Just do it for a month every time and just say I've been crucified with Christ and it will change the way you live your life it will change the way you go to the grocery store it will change the way you feel about that car that cuts you off and drives 45 when the speed limit says 55 the last one I'm going to cheat a little bit and, and move beyond the cross slightly I call it extravagant worship. The story I want to relate here is a, is a woman that came in to see Jesus. And so it's not about him on the cross, but it, she's anointing him for his death, for his grave. There was a woman, when G, this is Matthew 26. This story is, sh is shared in all the gospels. When, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. If I remember, this ointment cost a year's wages. What do you make in a year? Can you imagine having a flask of something that cost that many thousands of dollars? And she, she just came in and just poured it on him. 
just dumped them on them. And of course, her the disciples were offended. <laughs> There's poor people that this money could have gone toward. Jesus corrects them. Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. What a beautiful expression of extravagant worship. I've been challenged by this verse. How might I up my worship of our Lord? How might I give more than I give now? How might I worship him, show his worth? How might I pour my flask out for him in a way that, that he looks at me and says, now you're expressing my worth. I challenge you to, to think of how to more extravagantly worship God we visited Egypt, um, Egypt. No, we didn't go to Egypt. We went to Italy a few years ago. And traveling through that country, we went from church to church to church, watching one church try to outdo the other with how much more gold they could put on the walls and, and in the ornament. It just was like, became just, the opulence was just like, okay, here's another one. There's another gold church. But then then I, I, I read these script, the scripture of how this woman poured out something so expensive in order to show the worth of Jesus and it changes the way I think about it. However big he seems to you today, I want you to think on how you can make him seem bigger. That's what it means to magnify the Lord. Like Mary of Bethany, anoint him with your worship by giving him the best you have. Own your part of the cross experience his forgiveness be crucified to the world through him and worship him extravagantly thank you Yeah. Mm -hmm.
So 
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Almighty Father, we pray for your holy church. Fill it with all truth, in all truth, with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunited. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. O God of truth and love, who desires not the death of sinners, but rather that they should turn from their wickedness and live, look with mercy on those who are deceived by the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil, that the hearts of those who have gone astray may be restored to wisdom and return to the way of truth and the unity of your holy church through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery by the effectual working of your providence, carry out into our tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand.
Our Savior Christ has taught us we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, peace and rest to the dead, to your holy church unity and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and you reign one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Our services continue on Easter Sunday.